Marty. What's going on, buddy? How are you? Good, man. Good to see you again. I think I, it's. I, I saw you perform a couple times, but I haven't. I guess we haven't like seen each other personally in a while. But man, yeah. I tell you what, you go hard. It's awesome. <laughs> it, it's like you go. It's it's really cool to see. I Thank guess you. we talked on the phone. You told me you like believed in ghosts, or you texted something oh, about ghosts. I had a ghost story at my at my house. Um, is this a real story or it's is a real story, man? I I was always like apprehensive and skeptical, and there's some stuff that happened that I can't, I literally cannot explain, and I lived alone. I want to hear. Go ahead. Okay. Um, so I collect Native American artifacts, like arrowheads and stuff like that. And the short story is, I found a place on the Cumberland River that was very potent, and the river had gotten really high for a long time and then it dropped and so basically it had shaved away a lot of the dirt on the riverbank and um which is what you do when you go look right you wait for a big rain and it washes away new dirt and you find arrowheads in it and uh, a buddy of mine and myself found this spot and it was just there was like a ton of broken arrowheads a ton of arrow it was just really really potent and like fresh and we both kind of had like a uh we were like man this is like spooky because it's like the first time it's been revealed you know to the earth or whatever anyway so we found some stuff and i took it home and like a week later um man i mean there's a million stories i woke up all the lights would be on in the house uh all my countertop appliances would be unplugged my, uh, what my, do you mean unplugged like literally from the plug physically like, like blender toaster microwave uh lamp was this when you had enough money for a housekeeper maybe they did that no i lived completely alone and it would be like like it was on the night before, like when I went to bed, like a microwave. Nobody unplugs a microwave. Um, and were you drinking the night before? <laughs> no, dude. I'm telling you. That's my uh, thought. Callie and I hung a big mirror, um, and the next day we went to look at the mirror, and there was a giant scratch across the front of the mirror. Um, one night we were watching Yellowstone, and there's and no I, way you can't. There's no way you can justify the scratch. I, I I want to be able to, but I promise you, I cannot. I have no idea how to justify it. Okay, we, t- tell me the Yellowstone one then before I go on any farther. Go ahead. We we were watching Yellowstone, and we heard a noise downstairs, and, and she was like, what was that? And I was like, I sounded like a, ska- a chair got, like, scooted across the floor, and we had a chair from our kitchen table that had been, like, scooted, like, 10 feet out from our kitchen table. Do you have and a dog I, or a Roomba? No. No. Oh. And when I tell you, <laughs> like, I lived in Jolton in a house, in a cabin that's driveway was, like, a mile and a half long. In the middle of nowhere, nobody knows where this house is. Like, it's completely impossible that it was it was a person. Plus, the doors were locked and everything. So, it, your theory, can't sure. prove it right or wrong, is that it's possible that from your collection of Native American something artifacts, yeah. you brought something home. Yeah. And why do you still, do you still have these we, artifacts? So, we eventually... I dump them immediately. As soon as I thought that, I would get rid of them. <laughs> I, I had one moment. <clears throat> Callie quit staying with me because she was so freaked out because it was, it was always something. Like, it wasn't just those things. Like, it was like a light would turn on and off downstairs while we were awake. Like, it was crazy stuff that was never – it wasn't like poltergeist, like we saw anything or anything crazy. But I had one – there was five days in a row that I woke up at 2.59 or 3 in the morning on the dot. And the last morning I did it, I got up out of bed, and this – this house kind of, it just had a loft with a master bedroom and it was really creaky. It was a cabin. And when I got out of bed and turned my lamp on, something jumped from my lo- the loft of my house to the floor and ran through the house. And I jumped out of bed. I thought somebody, I literally thought somebody was in my house. It was a big thing, like a human sized thing. It wasn't like a mouse. No, okay. it, it shook the dishes in the dishwasher kind of deal. And uh, I jumped up and like went through the whole house. And, and then we went, Callie was like, let's get some sage and just try to see if we can sage the house. And we saged every corner. And I went in there with a, like a purpose and was very like stern and was like, if we have something of yours or blah, 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 like we're sorry, but we're, you know, we, we, it's time for you to leave. You said it out loud. Yeah. Oh, I'd have laughed. I'd have been, I, thought that I was felt it. like an idiot. <laughs> yeah, I felt like I an idiot. I would have too, yeah. And um, we'd never had a problem again. But my mom, who has never told a lie in her entire life, uh, would go out there occasionally. Just it was like a really pretty place, and my parents live here, so they would go out there to like hang out or something when I there or gone. And my mom said that she would go in that bedroom, the one with the mirror scratch, and that the lamp would turn on and off, and she would be like, "Okay, I'm leaving." And then as she would go to walk out the front door, that the lamp by the front door would turn on and off. After after we saged it, it's almost it's just like, like an electrical pro- problem. It is a cabin. You know, I mean, it could be a huge coincidence, but the chair scooting across the floor and the, and the scratch on the mirror and the the thing jumping from my loft, I cannot explain that. And it was 100% real. And I can't prove that it's not real because I wasn't there. Yeah. I, I obviously Do you not believe in ghosts at all? 
Uh, in the form of how people describe them, I struggle with it. I obviously think there are things bigger, and my brain does not have the capacity to understand right. things that it simply has not seen. I mean, I think there's so much that we can't even imagine that we don't even know is out there. I think science can explain it. I mean, we didn't know radio waves existed till like 100-something years ago. That's a great point, but science then proved they did, so now we do. So I guess until we have some sort of machine that pro- – <clears throat> so, yes, I, and that is a valid point until I, like, counterpoint you with going. But then science did go, that's true, and we so saw I don't have that, so I still can't. Well, I think that a lot of it is, like, people think it's all, like, hocus-pocus – and so they, they think it's silly to invest a lot of money and like time and to and you know invest in stuff that could try to prove that they were real. I think I can't prove that you're not right. And my <laughs> only story is my grandmother adopted me for a long time, uh, very instrumental in all my life. Lived with her for most of my life, and she left me a guitar, and it was a right-handed guitar, but she played it in church, and she never took a lesson. And, she, and you know, I went to a Pentecostal church when I was young. Before I went to a Baptist church, I grew up in a very rural town in Arkansas, and so she left it. And it was really all she had to leave. And I remember I was, like, talking. She had died and whatever. And I was like, okay, if you ever send me some kind of sign or whatever that thing. And her, the freaking guitar fell over. Oh, really? It fell. And I. Dude. Now, did I? I don't know. I don't know if I did something. I don't know. I don't think I kicked it. But the guitar fell over. Yeah. But I still struggle because I can't see it, touch it, feel it. Science sure. can't show me to just go, yes, it's absolutely true. But I can't tell you you're wrong. I just go, dang. Now listen to one more story. Lunchbox, tell him your story. And huh. then you tell me if you think he's legitimate because he's held on to the story for 15 years. So at my buddy's house who lived like four houses down from me, okay. spending the night one night, and I get up to go to the bathroom, and I walk down the hallway, and a ghost pushes me in the closet, locks the door, and it gets really cold in there. And I cannot open the door. And there is a ghost because we'd be there after school, and you would see footprints on the stairs in the front door would unlock and lock with us just sitting on the couch. Really? No one's touching it, and these guys do not believe me, but it 100% happened. <laughs> well, because you I also, believe you, man. He also says Tell that- him where the ghost touched you, though. No, no, there was no touching <laughs> oh, by the oh. ghost. <laughs> I'm just telling you. It shoved me in the closet, and I could not get out, and it got really, really cold in the closet. Uh. I can't yeah. prove it didn't happen, but he lies so much right. that just based on that alone, it's hard to believe it. Uh, look, Hardy's here. You have a new record that's that's out. Uh, we have a lot to talk about music-wise. We kind of got on that sidetrack there. But so as far as I would just imagine with you being such a prominent songwriter, and I don't know if you do this to yourself, but do you put extra pressure on yourself when you put out a project of your own because people know you for being a great songwriter and performer? I think so. Um, a little bit. Because it's not to be really good because we know – all the great stuff you've written for other folks, too. No, I agree. I, I think that it has to beat the stuff that I've had cut on other people or else people would just constantly be like, oh, why didn't you put that out yourself? Um, but, you know, it, like my record cycle is usually two years, and so, I mean, I, I pick usually – I mean, it still has to be me, you know, but I pick like the best 10, 15 songs of that those two years or so that for myself. Um, but you I, have do, anything, I feel the pressure for sure. Anything that you've held on for over a year that's, that made the record? Um. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jack, I think, was the first song that we cut. Um, and that one you still stayed in love with even a year later. Yeah. Because that's hard to that do. That was kind of the first song that, since the record's half country and half rock, that was the first song that uh, kind of sparked the rock side of things. So that we kind of based, that's the cornerstone of, of the rock side of stuff. So we held on to that one for forever. Party's here. New record, The Mockingbird and the Crow. It is out. You guys should check it out. How do you do, because there are 17 songs on this. I don't know. How do you, what's a good number of tracks? And then why do you cut it off? Or why did you add a couple more? You mean just to make a record? Yeah, or like I mean, 17. To, why the number? Why? Um, there really was no significance. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I really, we had, I think I had like seven and seven. And, and uh, Joey, Moy, and Seth were like, let's see if we can get a couple more. And it just sort of turned out to be that way. Um, and for it to be like a half and half thing, I wanted it to be like a decent amount on, on both sides. You've really walked that line though. Cause again, you say, that, and, and I've heard the record too, half's rock, half's country, but there's also kind of a blurry few songs on there too, that could be both. But I think you've created that space in country music where you listen and you go, well, yeah, sure. It's rock, but I could also hear this like, and in the opposite, I mean, you ever get those guys go, ah, you're too rock for this place, man. A little bit. I've, I mean, maybe not that, like, direct, but, um, yeah, I mean, some of that. When well, you were doing sure. Hicks tape, were people like, oh, I don't know, man, this is a little too crazy. It, it probably can't work. <clears throat> or did nobody care I enough? Mean, not. I wasn't big enough for anybody yeah. to care yet. <laughs> but, um, I mean, I definitely feel like uh, 
there's some apprehension, especially in the country world. I've actually been the rock world's been super, super cool and and uh, has accepted me more than I honestly even thought they would, and I'm very thankful for that. But uh, I mean, there's definitely been a little bit of apprehension um, from some of my songs being too heavy or whatever. You grew up in a small town in Mississippi. What was that town like, and what did people listen to either on the radio or CD? Like, what'd you grow up around? I grew up. Well, Philadelphia's awesome, by the way. I like you hear a lot of people talk about like I'm glad I left that, you know, blankety blank town, but I love my hometown and a lot of people most people in Philadelphia love uh Philadelphia. But uh man, I grew, my dad instilled rock and roll in me when I was like a little like a really little kid, so I became super obsessed with it and classic rock until I kind of discovered like MTV and and then could discover music on my own you know so i grew up listening to rock and roll but country country was around but i will say like a lot of people loved rock and roll and there were two or three there was a weird little music scene like a lot of of, of, like a weird amount of people could play instruments and there were bands and stuff in this little small town and uh so a lot of people rock and roll was really big in my in my hometown for sure in philadelphia mississippi did they have like a fake liberty bell no. Like a Mississippi Liberty Bell. Or no, like, no Philly cheese. Pie. I've always wondered about that. The high school team with the Eagles, like none of that, that stuff. That would be funny. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I, right? I've always thought it'd be kind of funny too, but we didn't adopt anything from the real Philly. I don't know why. You are loyal and you are you speak for Mississippi a lot. Um, like I, I do for Arkansas, right? Like I have Arkansas. Tech, every, a lot of yeah. what I do, I represent constantly and consistently. Yeah. Uh, why is that so important to you to be the guy from Mississippi? Man, I just, <clears throat> first of all, I don't, there's a lot of really big artists like Elvis, Robert Johnson, whatever, there's a million, a Faith Hill from Mississippi, but I, there's not a ton. And, and I just, I like making my hometown proud and making my state proud. And, and um, I don't know, man, there's just something inside of me that's extremely proud to be from Mississippi. I think it gets a bad rap and gets, it's the butt end of a lot of like, you know, redneck jokes and stuff like that. And I think taking pride in that is, is, is cool as opposed to, you know, getting, getting offended by it or, or whatever, but it's a state full of small towns. It doesn't have a city and it's just really unique. There's like one degree of separation between everybody in the whole state. Like you can meet some person that knows somebody, you know, if you don't know that person, it's, it's really special. I mean, you guys and us are like 49 and 50th in every poll. Every yeah. state. It's like Mississippi, Arkansas. It's like the yeah. fattest, yeah. the most littered, it's the like- most <laughs> pregnant. <laughs> But they only we can read. say that, and we can only make fun of it because we're that's us, right? Yeah, and if, but if somebody else does, man, I will, that, nothing that, I fires like me it, up like when somebody goes after Arkansas. Dude, I'm with you, man. So if you take your glasses and hat off, can you go incognito? Uh, the goatee kind of gets me still. I've tried. I did stagecoach, but I wore a, um, I wore like a big uh, quicksilver hat and a, um, a mask and. What are those sunglasses? The uh, Pit Vipers. The big, flashy, yeah. like look like eighties. It was so hot, man, in the mask. I like almost suffocated. Um, but I did it. I did it for like a whole day, and it was, it was. I did that. But I don't know. I haven't tried it too much. But maybe. Well, I can't see, but I've done it before. Like I'm. Is your vision bad? It's bad enough. Yeah, mine is really bad, and so I've taken my glasses off to walk through, like walk through, like an event for our our, our company, and even my bosses didn't know who I was. They were like, hey. Oh, really? No, had no idea. Yeah. Do you, you wear a hat mostly, don't you? Nah, I mean. Half and half? Enough. Yeah, enough. Yeah. But, I, but I have gray hair. Check it out. Oh, I can't see it from there. Yeah. Oh, you, oh I thought you said you had gray hair. No, great. No, you have good hair. You have good yeah, head of hair. Yeah, no, great. Yeah. I have gray hair. I have some. Great. You do? Is, yeah. are you, do you have your hair on top? Yeah. Yeah, I have, I have a good head. Because <laughs> you do have, wow. oh, you have a great head. Wow, he has great hair, too. That's nice. Mostly yeah. people just, that wear hats all the time are balding. Dude, I. You know, you get that from your mom's side of the family. Have you ever heard that? Like, if your mom's brothers had a full head of hair their whole life, then you probably will. And both my uh, mom's brothers have and or had a full head of hair. So I'm, I think I'm, I'm in the clear, I think. Do you ever plan to cut the – because it's not really a mullet. You just have long hair. No, I just have regular long hair. Has it always been that way since, like, high school? No, I had, like, the – they call it the Bama Bangs, dude. I had the frat boy, like, Justin Bieber – Thing. I cannot see school. that. At I know. All. I'm trying to picture it. You know what's annoying about Hardy? I think I have a picture on my phone. I'll show you at some point. So and it's it's terribly annoying that Hardy was also an awesome athlete too. Mm. <laughs> it's like these guys come in that are that are everything that I never was. Very talented, awesome athlete, can like sing, play guitar, creative, and it's like I should never even like this guy. I, I literally shouldn't like you. <laughs> Because I have all this like childhood angst from people like you, <laughs> but I do. I like you a lot. I appreciate that. Yeah, it's, look at me. I'm growing therapy, huh? How about that <laughs> Good therapy? For you. Hey, the the name, the mockingbird, and the crow. Just why? Um, 
it it basically signifies the struggle I have with um, the very watered down term is or is you know country artist versus a rock artist. Um, it's it talks about the mockingbird singing songs that sound like other songs you've heard, which is kind of sticking to the format, and that gets bleeds into the songwriter side of me too, and and you know writing songs for the radio. And so maybe, you know, the struggle I have with should I write more songs and sing more songs for the radio versus The Crow, which kind of is not as pretty and it, you know, it doesn't sound as as uh, pretty as a mockingbird and it kind of flies its own path. And it's just a song that talks about the internal struggle I have with that. Hey, what do you do for like mental health? I, I would assume as an artist, you, I'm going to insert my story in your story. There are uh, insecurities. You're a creative. You have a sp- times and spaces you need to go and be by yourself is any of that true by the way yeah would you consider yourself insecure in certain certain parts of your life maybe if i do if i am i, I don't know if i know it, but i go to therapy okay i have a therapist good for you what, yeah. do, you, what do you do for mental health so you go to therapy uh i mean you, go, you ever go like, away you ever you have somewhere you want to go away to yeah i just got back from mississippi um for two weeks i like to deer hunt but like the arrowhead thing i do i recharge alone um, so if I can spend like one day or half a day alone every week, that's like huge for me. I love, I just to be alone with my thoughts and stuff. And I don't know, it just, it helps me a ton. How does your new wife do with that? Because my wife does not need to be alone. Right. I do. I'm very much yeah. an alone person. I, and it was, it took a long time before she actually understood it wasn't about her. Right. And not that she was ever deeply offended. She was just like, I don't understand. I was like, what? Well, I need to be like alone for a while. Well, yeah, how- it has nothing to do with your significant other. It's just all about you. Did you have any sort of communication barrier there about that, or did she get it? No, she's dude. She's awesome. I mean, we she and I did like the premarital, like you know, um, therapy or counseling or whatever, and and um, we talked about a lot of that and most of the stuff we already knew about each other. But no, she's she's awesome. I mean, if you know, like I said, once a week I can just be like, hey, I'm gonna go do a thing. And I'll see you tonight or something, and and she's like totally cool with it. And she has her things too, you know. Um, but yeah, no, she's she's super super cool about it. Any songs on this record have to do with being like in a relationship and in love? Uh, I and Country is um, the only love song on the record. It's the only song about a girl. Well, I wouldn't expect like eight or nine or anything, but I figured no. at some point, yeah, you, there's you li- one. You live a life and you create from it. Yeah, sure. So something would be in there about that. Yeah, I and Country. Uh, so what? So what is that one though? I and country. Like what's what's the it's play basically here? Basically, like there, there. The hook is there ain't no I and country, but there's a Y O U, and it talks about like, uh, um, like I, I know how to do all this stuff. I know how to build a house on a hill, and and just all these things. You know, it, it's got a country twist on it, right? It's got the good old boy redneck twist, but it's basically like, but what's the point of all that if if I don't have somebody to do it for and to do it with? So it's like there ain't no I and country, but there's a Y O U. I slipped through the channels a couple weeks ago, and you. I saw you on wrestling. Yeah. And <laughs> my, I have I have a USA Network as one of my main channels. I'll flip through because I, my sh- my show's on USA. And so it just comes through like you do your like radio channels. And I'm flipping through and I see you like going through the ropes. And I'm like, what is happening here? <laughs> and then I worried you were going to get hurt. <laughs> because, I mean, I would assume those guys are, I mean, they know what they're doing and they're big and strong. Yeah. So how did you, because you, is WrestleMania, you're performing at something, right? Yeah, or you did? Uh, um Royal Rumble. Oh, um, the Royal, yeah. yeah. You know what that is? It's where every, they come down one at a time. Yeah. And then oh, yeah. they throw each other at last one. Oh, I just love Royal Rumble. San Antonio. <laughs> yeah. And We're doing that uh, next week, I think. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Did you, pra- like, how do you practice? We we rehearsed it. That's what everybody says. Wrestling is real, but it's rehearsed. And because that guitar was real, dude. That was, that really happened. You know what I mean? And um, so when a guitar gets broken over a human's back or gets, uh, you have to hit him in a certain spot. He, he, the guy was like, just hit me high, hit me high. Don't hit me. Uh, he was like, hit me on the wide part of my back. But, uh, and he was like, make sure it's just flat, like dead flat. And he was, I remember him saying, the harder you hit me, the worse it's going to hurt. So you might as well like swing for the fence and really try to hit me as hard as you can. Did you ever practice that guitar breaking though? Or was it a one time shot? I did. And they, they they had this like stunt guy backstage and he put this like vest on and he was like, all right, give it a shot. And he was kind of like, I think he never thought I'd swung anything before in my life. And he was like, so when you grab it, you grab it down here. <laughs> I'm like, dude, I've broken guitars before. And you play ball. You're a big yeah, baseball player like I too. Play yeah, baseball yeah. and stuff. So um anyway, so he did it and I did it as hard as I could and it didn't break. 
And then they all panicked. This was like an hour before I was supposed to do it live. And uh, now what they do is, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to say it anyway. They, they take the guitar apart. They take all the heavy stuff or the metal stuff from the inside. And then they hot glue it back together, which is still like, it's not like, right. you know, it's still, it still, it's hurts. still a guitar. It's still yeah. hard, yes. But um, I did it. And then the guy like panicked and he was like trying to coach me how to like swing it and stuff. And I was like, dude, I got it. And they gave, they had a different guitar. And it just, I think the one that they gave me at first was a little more put together. Were you relieved when it broke, when it was live? more relieved than I've ever been in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh, I just, I wanted to be like, yes, right there. Um, but it was awesome, dude. <laughs> also, they should take the metal stuff out of a guitar. We don't need yeah. to be convinced. <laughs> we know that these are great athletes. Yeah. We know. Can you imagine, like, no, the guitar needs to be legitimate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you yeah. need to hit him with Actually, every part electric of it. electric guitar, Les Paul. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then you came out, no injuries, no shoulder injuries, nothing. You're flying around. Well, all right. Good for yeah. you. Good for yeah, you. Yeah, man. The Mockingbird and the Crow, the tour dates, he starts in February. Go to hardyofficial.com, runs all the way through um, spring. You're doing, it's all over the place. But go check it out for the Mockingbird and the Crow with uh, Jameson Rogers on, on tour with you. Yeah, and yeah. a rock band, uh, big Blame My Youth, off uh, Big Loud Rock. Uh, we're going to wrap with this. These are five uncomfortable questions from listeners. <laughs> are, Hardy's, <laughs> are Hardy's glasses real or fake? They're real. Very real. Uh, who pays when you and Morgan Wallen go to dinner? Ooh, uh, my record label. Nice. He looks at them as he says that. (laughs) Does Hardy drive a cool car? Yeah. (laughs) This is where you answer what kind of cool car. I have a a Jack Roush edition uh, F-250 Super Duty, and I have a um, camouflage wrapped uh, F-150 King Ranch with 38-inch tires. It's a lot of gas. That's what I hear. That's a lot of gas. <laughs> he buys a lot of gas. It's yeah. easy to spot So, now. not a car. Oh, I know. Not the camouflage. You'll never see him. I took about? that the camo truck to my hometown to go deer hunting the last two weeks, and it was a huge mistake, dude. Yeah. It was a huge mistake. Uh, two more. What's the coolest part of Hardy's new house? Oh, oh man. Um, The... Uh, my, like, studio room. I love it. I have all my cool trinkets and stuff in there. Arrowheads? Yeah, tons. They stay in there. Uh, opposite yeah. end of the bedroom. Probably won't go. <laughs> and finally, how did Hardy get famous? <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, that's good. that's my answer. Good enough for us. There he is, Hardy, everybody. Yeah. New album's out. The Mockingbird and the Crow. Go check it out. Go see him on tour. We'll be back in a minute. It's, it's about the show.